Welcome to Chairside Live, the podcast that tackles the challenges that dentists face every day and discusses the latest advances in dentistry with top clinicians and industry leaders. And now, here's your host, Dr. Neil Park. Our guest today is Gerald Nisnik, DMD, MSD. And it's really interesting because Barron's Magazine referred to Dr. Nisnik as a prosthodontist and entrepreneur who is considered by many as the godfather of American implant dentistry. And you know what? No reasonable person could argue with that description. He directly founded the companies Corvent, Paragon, and Implant Direct. And indirectly, he founded Solzer Dental and Zimmer Dental. So that's what five major implant companies that he was behind. He graduated from the University of Manitoba Dental School, did specialty training in prosthodontics at Indiana University. I can't think of anyone who more embodies the concept of the clinician entrepreneur than Dr. Nisnik. He designed dental implants in the 80s that are still in widespread use. And throughout the 80s and 90s, he personally trained over 10,000 dentists worldwide on the placement and restoration of dental implants with lectures and live surgical demonstrations. With over 30 patents, he's responsible for implant designs that revolutionize dental implant treatment. By selling implants primarily through the internet for $150 with no volume discounts, he created the value segment of the implant industry. He's published dozens of papers, including the largest dental implant study worldwide, which was done at 32 VA centers that included 900 patients with over 2,800 implants. He's received numerous awards and honors, which are truly too numerous to mention. He's also made significant philanthropic gifts to advanced dental education, including a $7.5 million gift to the University of Manitoba, which has been renamed as the Gerald Nisnik College of Dentistry. Dr. Nisnik, it is a pleasure to have you, and thank you so much for joining us on the Chairside Live podcast. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. I'm exhausted after listening. <laughs> oh, no. Well, there you go. The one thing I would add is that Nobel BioCare today is selling Implant Direct's products. They Isn't they, that they moved- amazing? You know, because when I worked for Nobel, to say you were the devil incarnate would really not be fair to the devil himself. And yet now they're out there selling your product. It's it's incredible. It's they referred just- to me as he whose name cannot be mentioned. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. I remember Thomas Albertson, he said, he said about you, he goes, Dr. Nisnik quotes literature the way the devil quotes the scripture. Yes. Did, did, had you ever heard that before? <laughs> I never heard that, but he never he did that to sidestep my question about uh, pure titanium and alloy. They were claiming that time that alloy didn't work. The aluminum would go to the brain and called, uh, cause Alzheimer's. And I asked the question in 1990 at the Academy of Austin Integration meeting in Vancouver, is there anybody else in the literature that backs up your claim? And he didn't answer the question. He came back with that very uh, sharp remark. But Absolutely, yeah. I suffered the slings and arrows. So this is interesting because most of the time when people interview, it becomes kind of a history lesson. And with all due respect to the important role that you played in this history, I'd like to take this in a different direction because there are so many young doctors that could benefit from your unique perspective. Let's try to give some advice to young dentists just starting out. I'm going to hit you with a whole bunch of questions, and I just have a feeling you're not going to have any trouble handling these handling these questions. My first suggestion to a young dentist is to deal with Glidewell because they wow. are so far <laughs> ahead of uh, the industry on dental lab and CAD milled procedures. Um, uh, it's just amazing what you guys have done there. Well, we learned a lot from you. Reducing the cost for the doctor and hence for the patient is what Jim's all about, right? And that's and that's certainly what you've done. Let's talk a little bit about the implant itself, where these doctors are going to find an implant. Internal versus external connection. I mean, you had something to do with that internal connection, didn't you? Yes, I invented it in 1986 when they were saying the Bronomark external hex was the gold standard of the industry. The problem was screws were coming loose. There was a number of other problems. The hex would strip because they made it out of pure titanium. 
1986, I came up with the screw vent, which had a lead-in bevel internal hex, which today they call the conical connection. The patent that I got covered any lead-in bevel, whether it be 45 degrees, which I was doing and which most companies do today, or whether it's Nobel's 78 degrees or uh, or Astra's uh, 70, 81 degrees. It's all the same. Lead-in bevel, it added lateral stability and allowed to make a narrow diameter implant. So, you know, when I was working for Nobel and external hex was the, imp was the uh, implant that they had, as you said, loose screws, breaking screws was an everyday occurrence. We had a whole technical services department that, that did that. And once they switched to an internal connection those problems, they almost completely went away. That's right. And they couldn't bring in the Nobel Active until 2007 when my patent expired. The patent was sold to uh, uh, what became Zimmer Dental, and they're still selling the, the implant that I developed in 86 and then the tapered one in, in um, 99. But Nobel and Implant Direct both couldn't launch an internal conical connection until... Uh, 2007 when the uh, patent expired. So the Zimmer Dental or the Zimmer Biomet TSV, tapered screw vent, I mean, that's almost your implant without any changes, right? Exactly. That was 1999. And it's really become the cornerstone of modern implant design. They just posted a 20-year video on the results and they're pretty darn good pretty hard to improve on 99% success. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. So internal connection, no question. That's the way to go. How about a tapered, you know, talking about the macro structure, a taper versus a parallel wall? The only purpose for a tapered implant is that you can drill an undersized hole, get the narrow end of the implant started, and as you screw it in, it will compact the bone and increase initial stability. There was a study just published that showed that it will also expand the ridge as much as 0.86 millimeters. So you're getting ridge expansion and ridge compression, and you need that high initial torque if you want to do immediate load. Okay. What about the fact that since the implant is narrower at the apex, that you can sort of avoid some anatomical structures that you'd prefer to avoid? You know, that was the initial story of the trilobe implant uh, from Stereos, that the tapered implant would help you avoid perforation on the lingual. I don't put much stock into that because... The, the difference in width between the wide point and the, and the narrow point is a, a fraction of a millimeter. So it, it, we only tapered at two to three degrees. The Nobel Active tapered at nine degrees. And the problem with such an extreme taper is it would get stuck in the bone. If the bone is a little dense and you try to screw it in to a real small hole with that uh, dramatic taper, it would get stuck in there. And that's why on that implant, they had to put a reverse cutting groove. Instead of a cutting groove that helped self-tap insertion, they put a counterclockwise cutting groove in to help get the implant out after it got stuck. So I'm not so concerned about encroaching on anatomical uh, things. It's just a tapered implant. Half of it drops into the hole, so you've shortened your insertion time. And then you expand and compact the bone, and it's proven to be very successful. Very good. Very good. What about implant surfaces? When you and I were working back 20 years ago, that was a point of contention, you know, was HA versus machined, whatever. But where do we sit now after all these years? What is the optimal implant surface? I personally believe that HA is the optimum surface because of the, the studies that show faster, stronger attachment. But once I developed the soft bone, hard bone surgical protocol, undersizing a socket in soft bone, and then making it a full size in dense bone. Once you get that compaction, then you don't really need the HA, uh, the, the uh, a rough surface from blasting or and not so much etching. Etching uh, alone doesn't create a rough enough surface. You can make the surface too rough, like Thai Unite and the old TPS from Strauman creates too rough a surface. And, and then if you lose a little uh, bone at the crest and that porous surface becomes exposed, you can have soft tissue problems. And the offshoot of that is today, Nobel has added a anodized surface for the first two millimeters. They're claiming that anodized surface 
will help soft tissue attachment, but really it's just to get the rough surface deeper into the bone so it won't get exposed. Right, right. I mean, it seems like most people have kind of settled on what we consider a medium rough surface, right. sort of the resorbable blast media kind of a creation of a surface. You, you can blast with two things. You can blast with aluminous oxide or titanium oxide the way Astra does, but then you need to etch to get that blasting off and that rounds the threads. So if you just blast with uh, the way Glidewell does it, the way I do it, uh, Zimmer, it, with a, a resorbable blast material. In other words, HA crystals that dissolve in, in, in the water solution, and you end up with a clean, rough microsurface. Right, because if, if you have to get that blast media off with acid, haven't you kind of smoothed the surface over a little bit? Probably not, because they use very large grit, and then they acid uh, etch it. But what you do is you round the threads and you round the cutting uh, uh, group. Got so it. Strauman uses, um, uh, they call it SLA, sandblasted with large grit. But most companies are using RBM or soluble blast media, SBM. It's same thing. It's HA crystals. Now, the big controversy is whether you should blast to the top of the implant or leave a millimeter or so from the top, leave it smooth. And I go both ways on that. Uh, undoubtedly, if you blast to the top, you're going to have a better chance of delaying bone resorption because a smooth surface encourages bone to resorb down along it. On the other hand, today, dentists are, are playing with the vertical height of the implant. They might want to drop the implant down into the bone a little bit or leave it a little bit above the bone. So having a, a millimeter of a smooth surface is okay uh, or blasting to the top is okay. Got it. Got it. What about all this uh, laser surfacing that I'm hearing about, you know, that to get the soft tissue to react better to the collar of the implant? You're talking about BioHorizons laser lines, right? I'm letting you say the brand names. I'm just describing it. <laughs> yeah, BioHorizons has laser lines. If you go to my website in the articles section, there's a study that showed that it had no effect on, on reducing bone loss. It is a great plaque collector, though, if it gets exposed. And they even carry the laser lines up onto the abutment to encourage soft tissue attachment. But soft tissue will attach just the machine titanium. So I think in the neck, micro threads, micro grooves, yes, micro threads better. And the reason you need micro is that you got this big hex hole in the center of the implant. So you can't have real deep threads near the top of the implant on the smaller diameter implants, but you would like to have that surface threaded, especially if you're putting an implant into four or five millimeters of bone under the sinus, having threads in the, in the top uh, two to three millimeters of the implant adds stability. So I like micro threads, micro grooves. It, you know, for a young dentist, the question is, does he have to figure out the right implant? And, and the fact of the matter is that all these implants will work if you follow the manufacturer's protocol and if you know what you're doing. So what really differentiates one product versus another? I, I try and put all the bells and whistles that I think are important, but I can't say definitively that if you did a study side by side between the designs that I prefer and some other designs, whether you'd see any clinically significant difference. So, what, what separates companies, I think, is, um, I, well, I like to offer all-in-one packaging with Implant Direct, and that made it easier for the dentist for inventory and to know what went with what and have it all there. So that was our, what we call, unique selling proposition. Glidewell's unique selling proposition is they're backed up by the world's biggest and best uh, dental lab, and uh, and they, you give a discount if they... Uh, uh, on the lab. Right. If they use the Han impact. system, they get 20% off on yeah. the lab, which is a pretty considerable discount. Yeah. I don't know how I'd compete with that if I went back into business, but I, you know what? I think I'd figure it out. <laughs> I think you would. I think you would. You know, because of my Nobel background, I have to ask you the question uh, commercially pure titanium versus titanium alloy, which wins out? Oh, <laughs> I, in 1990, I switched everything to titanium alloy and just stopped fractured implants. 
pure titanium, even grade four cold worked is about 40% weaker than the uh, 6-4 alloy. Now, Strauman, to be different, came up with zirconia titanium alloy, and they call it rock solid or something like that. Uh, just to be different. For all the years they had pure titanium, when they finally went to um, alloy, they had to do something different for marketing. Nobel is stuck with pure titanium because tie unite their anodized surface won't form on an alloy. Uh, I would say a dentist should find an implant that is made of titanium alloy, uh, which I'm sure Glidewells is. Um, Absolutely. Yep. It, it's easier to machine. It's stronger. You can have smaller diameter implants. Even the companies that have grade four titanium, if they make an implant that's uh, 3.5, you'll look at their precautions instructions and they have all kinds of warnings about where not to use it. A fractured implant is, is such a devastating event for a patient. I just don't understand why somebody would use an implant that's made out of a significantly weaker material. I just don't get it. Uh, well... <laughs> There's a lot of people using uh, a Nobel uh, with Tie Unite, and they're buying into the story. But, uh, you know, there, I saw so many broken trilobe implants. Now, at least they've gone to the conical connection on their Nobel Replace. Right. And, and the trilobe made the walls even thinner than a conical connection. So that might help some of the fractures. They have to do that because all their research was based on Bronomark's pure titanium implant. They can't suddenly start changing or they couldn't because they couldn't, wouldn't relate to all their published research. And that was their unique selling proposition that they had the research and other people didn't. That doesn't mean anything today because these companies come out with a new implant every other year. Exactly. Uh, so yeah. uh, having long-term research uh, today means a year. Yeah, I mean, that the history of Nobel, which you know as well as I do, there was a little bit of uh, religiosity around P.I. Brandemark. Yes. When I got there, it was uh, absolutely forbidden to take a radiograph of the implant after you placed it. Well, what was going to happen? You know, something with the radiation was going to happen. Absolutely no literature behind it, but it was the religion. And it wasn't until they merged with Stereos and ownership changed that right. finally they said, you know what, you, you know, do like any x-ray, you take it based on what the benefit is to the patient. That's right. They, originally, they said you couldn't do immediate insertion, take out a tooth, put in an implant because you wouldn't be able to close it over the top and everything had to be buried. And uh, I, I killed that uh, sacred cow pretty quickly. Absolutely. Absolutely. Jerry, you have more than 30 patents and you've developed hundreds of unique products in implant dentistry. Of all those developments, what are you the most proud of? What do you think was the greatest contribution to implant dentistry? Well, I think the internal conical connection in 1986 became the cornerstone of, of modern implant design. There's not a company out there today that doesn't, I, I should I take that back. There's one that doesn't have a conical connection. I think it's Thomann has a, a butt joint connection or something. But I think the conical connection in the screw vent and then the tapered screw vent, and the I uh, wrote an article on soft bone, hard bone surgical protocol to increase success in soft bone. I think those contributed, but you know, there were many people that contributed. I would see an idea, I say, that's good. I think I'll, I'll change it or I'll make it better. People looked at my ideas and they modified it and some of them were good and some weren't. So it's, we're really fortunate to be where we are today where we know these implants are more successful than conventional dentistry. I mean, uh, people send me x-rays of 37-year follow-up on the core vent with no bone loss. Right. My mother-in-law had uh, a core vent and a screw vent in for 36 years till she died at 99. So we, it's great for dentistry that they work. Every young dentist needs to get involved with implants. Believe me, placing an implant is easier than doing a, a, a three-unit bridge. And it's certainly easier than doing a molar endo. <laughs> so what about this whole thing? You know, the, earlier there was quite a controversy where the periodontists and the oral surgeons didn't feel like GPs should be placing implants. And now we're in a situation where far more implants are placed by GPs than by specialists. So that whole idea of, gee, if you're a GP placing implants, you're really treading on thin ice. I mean, that's gone away by now, hasn't it? When I had an implant and when my wife had an implant, we went to a GP. 
that I had trained that I knew uh, could do implants and could do the restoration. I'll never forget uh, seeing a case from an oral surgeon. He brought me an x-ray and he had put the implant right into the nerve. And I said, look, I made this thing idiot proof, but apparently I didn't make it oral surgeon proof. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Now, if an oral surgeon puts it through the through the nerve, that means it's supposed to go through the nerve, right? Well, today that doesn't happen with <laughs> CT scans. And today the oral surgeons and periodontists are a lot more cognizant of the restorative aspects of implant dentistry and can direct the case very nicely. I refer cases to oral surgeons and just refer to case to a periodontist uh, in my area, Frank Niver, who did a two implants on my brother-in-law years ago. Uh, so it's all good. Anybody that, that wants to do it can do it. Right, right. You mentioned cone beam CT. Is that a necessity if, if, if a GP is going to place implants? Does he need to have a cone beam? Absolutely not. I'm old school. First of all, if you're going to place an implant, implants in the symphysis, or if you're going to take out a bicuspid and the hole is right there, why do you need a, um, a CT? Now, if you're going to do a full arch case, then you should have a CT. If you're uh, placing a couple uh, implants in lower posterior and near the mandibular canal, it's probably a good idea to have a CT and to make a surgical stent. Dentists can get started and, and just go as fast as they feel confident to do. I used to use uh, uh, a, a two by two x-ray with a grid on it. So I drill the hole, I put the guide pin in, take an x-ray, and I could count how many millimeters I was away from the vital structures. Either way, but I'll tell you, a C, having a CT in the office is probably a, a good income source and will get you more involved in implants than, than uh, otherwise. Yeah, I mean, they can buy a cone beam today for what we used to pay for a Panorex machine. Probably. There's a lot of great brands out there. So now the market, and you started this, right, that to say that a high quality implant does not have to have a premium price, that you sort of proved that you can disconnect quality from price. You know, what's interesting is I just did a post uh, about a week ago on LinkedIn, and it says this is what I was struggling with for all these years. 9,000 people downloaded that post. And there was 51 comments. So if anybody wants to go to LinkedIn and read the chain, yes, there's no relationship. Now, certainly you get a company like Nobel and Strauman, and they have all the financial resources for education, marketing, customer service. You can't take that away from them. You go to the other end of the, the, the spectrum and uh, as, as somebody importing a cheap uh, Israeli implant and then trying to be a distributor doesn't have the inventory, doesn't have the quality control. Uh, they're dependent on what the manufacturer did. So I think you want to buy from a reputable company. I mean, the biggest expense that these premium companies have is you got a sales rep driving a BMW and he's got a regional manager driving a Mercedes. That's a lot of expense built in. I mean, what you did with Implant Direct to say that, okay, we're going to put a lower price. You're not going to have, and now later on, you did add reps. Yes. Why did you decide to go ahead and, and change your model? I started out, I did uh, 5 million in sales in California without a rep. And then what happened is that the reps from the other companies would go into a customer that had bought my implants and badmouth us. Uh, they go into a surgical specialist or the specialist referring dentist. So to get to the next level, I ended up with 50 or 60 salespeople, maybe 70 salespeople, but I paired each salesperson with an inside technical person as well. And we needed to do that at that time. Now, I don't think it'd be necessary today when I was selling a, a relatively inexpensive implant at 150 with all in one packaging the Nobels of the world could make the dentist feel nervous that he might not, you know, be getting a high quality product. They soon saw that it was, and we ended up with the number one customer service record in the United States. There was an independent study and we were number one of customer satisfaction. And that was a lot due to having inside reps that uh, were well technically trained. Right. I mean, here at Glidewell with the Han system, we do very well with inside reps. And then most of our, our work is done with educational programs, supporting education. That's where we find our new customers. Yeah, if I were to go back into the implant 
industry today, uh, I would definitely be religious uh, on Zoom marketing. I would stay away from outside salespeople, although there's some great ones. And I imagine you need a few of them to attend the trade shows. But really, uh, the, the target market today is experienced dentists. Now, I'll leave the new dentists and the training courses to uh, Glidewell and Nobel. But if I were to go back in the industry, I would be targeting experienced dentists. Right. And to the higher volume folks. So let me ask you this. So, so the young dentist that's out there, he, he graduated from school where he had almost no exposure to implant dentistry. Now he or she is out there and wants to get started. Where should they get that training that they need? I think that whoever's giving a course, whether it be a uh, prosthodontist, there's a guy called Implant Ninja that, uh, that handholds dentists and trains them. He's up in Northern California. There's a lot of uh, uh, the uh, AAID has their continual program, which is a great way, uh, five or six two-day sessions. There's plenty of information just online if a dentist wants to learn. I think that uh, th there's a lot of opportunity. And how about, okay, so I've gotten some training. I've, I've bought a system. How do I get started in my practice? Do what I did. I did a lot of free implants. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to the experience, so I... Um, I did a lot of uh, cases uh, uh, at very little or no charge. Start simple. Start with a totally dentulous patient, two implants in the symphysis with an overdenture attachment. I was the first guy to ever publish a case like that in 1982, and it's now become minimum standard of care for prosthodontists uh, to treat dentulous patients. So start there. Start with a, a, a single bicuspid uh, tooth that's lost, healed molar site. Attend whatever course you want. Buy whatever system they sell, because that's the one you're trained on. But then don't get stuck in the rut of staying with that system. Uh, then once you learn a little bit, open your eyes and, and look at uh, what that system offers. Uh, or if you're more discerning, you'll look at it before you buy that system. Absolutely. Absolutely. Dr. Nisnik, you know, I expected you to have encyclopedic knowledge of the implant industry and the technology, and, and you've, you've not disappointed me at all. Thank you. A an incredible level of knowledge and understanding, and all the years that you've been in this field, uh, you learned some good lessons, and thanks for passing them on to us. I, I would say that uh, if you visit nisnik.com, there's a lot of information, a lot of history there, and the controversies section, I've answered so many questions about the various companies' marketing claims and the validity of, of those claims. It's called unique selling proposition. They come up with something that's different, and then they try and convince you that, that that's the key to success. And I have said that if they put peanut butter on an implant and got three opinion leaders to say that was critical for success, they could probably sell a peanut butter coated implant. Smooth or crunchy, either way, right? <laughs> Very good. Dr. Nisnik, it was a pleasure. I will look forward to chatting with you again. And when are you going to come and visit us here at Glidewell? Um, I'll get down there. I always enjoy it. Give my best to Jim Glidewell. I read his book. It was inspirational, exhausting, but inspirational. <laughs> and uh, and um, uh, give my best. And I think you, you Glidewell, and Jack Hahn, who started implants the same time I did, we took our test at AEID the same time, are doing a great job for the general dentist. Very good, very good. I'm heading up tomorrow to Chicago for the AAID, and Jack is getting the Isaiah Liu Award, so I'm, I'm excited to, uh, to be right, with I him. All right, I got that in 91, so tell him he's 30 years behind. <laughs> I will tell him that. <laughs> very good. Thanks so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you for joining us. Visit chairsidelivepod.com to see show notes and supplemental materials for each episode. Be sure to subscribe and leave us a review. We'd love to hear from you. Email us anytime at Chairside Live Podcast at GlidewellDental.com. Chairside Live is produced by Andy Klein and is recorded and mixed by Maurice Weibel. You can listen to our show on Apple iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts.